Okay, and the last line of 99b, it's like test number base. And the Gemara continues the discussion of the definition of the Epicurtus, the one who puts himself outside the camp of those who are the Jewish people who are worthy of the world to come. And as well as the other dif- the other uh, distinction, one who reveals or uses Torah in a negative, in, a, in an anti-Torah way. Yes, so first, we, and it's more severe than the Epicurus, and we have to juxtapose the two, which one should you give a definition to one, we have to compare the other definition, etc. Yeah. And um, uh, you just mentioned before, that's not the mission, as we kept on saying before, it's actually yeah, the Bryce... It's in the previous it's like test Aleph. <laughs> okay, so last lines like this: the Gemara um, was going through, uh, like, like lowering the bar, as you were, for disrespect of those who teach Torah, those who lead the community, and those who are responsible in guiding, uh, teach, learning, and guiding. And as you mentioned, and as we concluded yesterday, even someone who doesn't guide, although he should, if he's a learner of Torah, he should share that with others. But even if he doesn't, as the Gemara mentioned, he still, Gemara quoted verses, that still the world stands in the merit of these people. And then the Gemara goes even further um, in terms of how one should speak of uh, the scholars and the sages. The Gemara point Omar, last line. That, that, that someone who studies there's a person, the Adam Amol Yulad, so he wears Rosh Hashanah. Is Lilmot Almanat Lamed. So real Amelim B'Torah, those who really toiling in Torah, have to learn for the sake of teaching. Exactly, they have. They have to have that, that kind of like um, conviction, that kind of vocation. Yeah. They have to, they're, they're studying in order to teach. So realistically, it wouldn't happen. A person who really likes Torah, we want to teach others. Mm-hmm. On the contrary, also you know, you learn more if you tell me than anyone else. And then that's also another reason why a person serves in Torah can't just. Yeah. By Reality shows us there are people who feel the other way, but you're, I agree with you. No, but the, the majority opinion. But, 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 but no, I mean like there are people who, in reality, sit and learn, don't teach others. But it's, it's, <coughs> rare, it's but rare, uh, rare. I mean, most have some kind of sheer somewhere. Maybe they don't. You know. Okay. Last line of the page. Rav Amar Rav says, Kagoyin, what's an example of not being courteous? What's an example of someone who's not being respectful of the sages? Kagoyin, for example, Hani the Bay Binyamin Asya, like those of the household of Binyamin the doctor. The Amri, who they used to say, Maya Hanul Rabbanon Ma'olam. What have the rabbis ever done for us? And there is the next packet, Kufa Madala from the top. So the people of the, do- of the house of Binyamin the doctor would say, What do these scholars ever do for us? on Orva, they've never came along and made a uh, raven uh, kosher. And they've never told us that a, that a dove is forbidden. What they mean to say is, as Rashi tells us, that they haven't added anything. Everything they tell us we already know from Torah. What, what's, what's, the, like, what's the point? It's like they, 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 they make as if like they're uh, the gatekeepers of information. Go open the Torah, they never change anything. You know, the Torah says that uh, raven's forbidden, and then, then so do they say raven's forbidden. Torah says a dove is permissible, they also say a dove is permissible. What do they do? What do they contribute? So rather than proving himself, Rava would do the following. So Rava says to the Gemara, Kiavamaisi trefos the baby nyamen, when they would bring a, tr- a questionable uh, piece of chicken or piece of meat from the house of Binyamin, from his people who would mock the fact that the scholars don't contribute anything. So the, when they would bring a shaila to the, to the Rav, to Rava, so in response, when he found some reason to say that the chicken or the meat, whatever they brought to him was kosher, he would say, Omar Lahu, he would tell them, Tachazu, do you see? Tachashardina lucha urva. I've made permissible for you a raven. There is no raven, but he's indicating to them that you're coming to me for information, right? So there is something we're contributing here. But he would use their term, like they were joking and saying that the sages didn't, they were mocking and saying that the sages don't contribute anything because all they tell us is information that's already exists in the Torah. Torah says, raven's forbidden, you're saying raven's forbidden. And yet here you are asking me a question and I'm telling you the answer, right? Okay, look, you see I made a raven permissible by telling you the chicken is kosher. And then the reverse. 
when he would see some reason uh, that it's forbidden, whatever this questionable, the shayla, the meat that they brought to him, they would say to him, you see, I made for, I told you a dove is forbidden. No, it's using their words. Just to explain a little bit more what's, what this means, bringing the chicken to the rabbi. Today we don't do that because you buy pre-packaged meat that has a hechsher on it, a stamp that says that there is a person who certifies that the whole process was done. But back in the day, uh, not so long ago, um, you used to buy, own or buy live chickens, feed it bread for a couple of days so it's nice and fat, take it to your local shochet, pay him whatever kopecks it costs to have him, she- to have him shecht it, and then you take it home yourself and prepare it. You would salt it, you would prepare it, you do all of it, and then after, if you're going through it, then you see for the most common child, and that's what the Gemara refers to as trefa, is you go through it and you see the lung is punctured, or you find that the leg is broken, the chicken, that you just paid your shochet to prepare, to, to slaughter for you. And the halacha is that if the animal couldn't survive the illness that it had before it was slaughtered is treif. That's the word treif actually means. We use it as a broad term to say everything that's not kosher, but treif is specifically animals that are not healthy enough to survive at the, at the moment of their death. Actually, what we call treif is really nevela. It's correct. It's more than nevela. It's correct. Nevela is an unslaughtered kosher animal. An un- a kosher animal that wasn't slaughtered is called nevela, not treif. That's so correct. It died by itself or it died slaughtered by a non-Jew? Which died, ju- died not through shechita, is nevela. So this is the most common common thing that a person brought a question to it of. You brought a chicken from your house and say, Rabbi, I just brought the shechted, and look, I see the lung here. It looks like it has a bump. Is it a problem or not? Is it glut or not? Or something like that. And you would check to see if the lung is smooth or not smooth, and all the rest of that. So that's what, that's what it's referring to here. That was the most common uh, thing. It's, it was so common that uh, my, my grandmother used to do it once a year for her children to see, because for her, this is the whole part of Yiddishkeit. A big part of Yiddishkeit was you brought them a chicken and you learned how to prepare it. Her mother taught her how you prepare chicken, how you salt it, how you, how you, how you make a kosher. And her kids don't know this because they go to buy a pre-kosher chicken. I have to show them what it's like. So she used to bring it home every now and again just to show them what you do. It's not because that's not as much part of Yiddish kind of was, you know, like, kind of like the way I would take my boys and say, come, let's build a sukkah together. Let's go prepare the chicken. You so that mothers it's teach it's their daughters. That, that's uh, it's a shame that's how common it was. That today in modern society, <laughs> that we don't have those skills anymore. Yeah, in some ways, yeah. You already have pre-packaged kosher meats. The really the only downside is that there are times that depending on how you cook your meat, you don't have to salt it so much. But because you're buying pre-packaged, they're always salted. So if you didn't do that, you might be able to get juicier meat if you cooked it the right way. I don't want to no, give away all the halachas, the but they're all... Salt is to draw out the blood. That's correct, but depending on how you cook it, there's certain ways of cooking right. where the blood is drawn out through the cooking process and you don't need to salt it as much as we do. Yeah, roasting, for example. Ro- not roast, uh, if it's an open flame, roasting today means in an oven in a pot. That would not no, be no, counted I mean, roasting. roasting like a yeah. Rotisserie it's specifically an open fire. flame. Open fire. Specifically an open flame without any grates, without anything, just on an open flame, then you have to salt it much less, which would mean you'd get... My, I once had it in Israel. I once uh, got an unsalted meat and did that. But uh, ordinarily, and that's, that's really the one downside of not preparing your own meat. That you just always have it fully salted. But that okay, but it's still all good. Prepared on, a, uh, on an open flame, the, after the meat was slaughtered, they would have let the blood drip out anyways, wouldn't they? Draining the blood is one thing, and salting is something else. Right. The different, they're two different stages. Bring the, the, the blood from the inside out. That's correct. Yeah. And that comes out through uh, open flame as well. But it's not as deep. It's still it's not as deep as you would if you were salting. No, no, the it doesn't come out as dry. The surface blood would have dried. I know. I'm saying when you the method of removing salt by salting, the method of removing oh, blood through salting, and the remo- method of removing blood yeah. by roasting is not the same. Right. That's all I'm saying. But today you don't get that experience because all the meat you buy is already salted and prepared. But back in the day it wasn't, and that's the kind of questions that the house of Binyamin, like many other Jews, were bringing to the rabbi, and Rebbe was using their mockery to kind of say, "Look, you're coming to me with questions. So look, I made a raven." kosher or look I made your dove not kosher it's interesting even though they criticize the rabbis they still, they still brought the raven like, today exactly. they, don't, they criticize they don't bother at all they say, that's, See, that, that's, that's true that's, even though they criticize the rabbis because of Madrega and their uh, that's right. observance also it's interesting it's not Benjamin himself yeah. it's not the doctor himself but his house but it's his household which is interesting but anyway I don't know 
that means anything, but that's a good point. That I'm not, even notwithstanding the fact that, we, that they were making fun of the rabbi, they were still bringing the shilohs to the rabbi. But unfortunately, they must feel that, that, that they went to go off the path completely. They would make fun of the rabbis, and they would uh, while they were yeah. still still at the courses. Yeah. Doing, yeah. So this is what this is what um, Rabbi is saying. That treaty, uh, speaking of rabbis in such a fashion that as, as in they're useless, even though you're actually using them, is is in itself the epicursus in disrespect of the rabbis. Okay. Rapapa, Omar Papa says, goes even farther. Kagoin, for example, the Omar, someone who says, Hani Rabbanan, oh, those rabbis. That phrase. Oh, these rabbis. That phrase in and of itself, says Rapapa, is enough to be considered apikoresis. Now, it's so prevalent, that way of speaking, that Rapapa himself, Ishtali, he once forgot. But Omar, and he said, Kagoin, Hani Rabbanan, like those rabbis. He used the very phrase, that he said is considered apicursus. You people don't share it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> good call. Very good. <laughs> He's right, you know. We're not going to go there. Just so, that Papa once forgot, <laughs> Ishtaliva Omar, and he said, Kagun Hanan Abadan, like those rabbis, and he used that phrase that he himself said is apicursus. Ve'isiv batanisi. And he sat in fasting to try to, uh, to atone for having misspoke. Uh, with respect to his fellow sages. It's not like he was a simpleton who knew nothing and saying, oh, these rabbis, without having any idea of what the rabbis are putting up with and what they're doing and what they know and what they don't know. The Pope himself was a sage. So he knew what the rabbis are going through. He understands the validity of what rabbis do. And yet, because he mis mis misrepresented them in his verbal use, not scoffing what they do, he knows what they do. He's in, he's in the same business. The Pope was a scholar. But by mis uh, speaking about them, sat in fasting, um, to atone for having misspoke about his colleagues. Shows you quite a level. Tells you two things. First of all, how prevalent it is that even someone like a papa slipped. And on the other hand, it tells you what kind of person a papa is that he took it so seriously. But okay. Saying those rabbis who learn so much but don't teach anything. Which we've yeah. done before is, you know, a Isn't message to the rabbis. That they should be teaching as well. Yeah. It doesn't say the context of what the context. It doesn't say of, of the context of He may have been saying something totally yeah. um, you know laudatory even. Does, does, yeah, it does not say the context in which your papa used that phrase, these rabbis. As opposed to saying like Rashi says, uh, the scholar from such and such place said such and such. She said, Oh, these rabbis. It's not respectful. It's not a respectful way. Even it doesn't say the context, even if he's saying something praiseworthy, yeah, that's like, correct. He's not criticizing. He's saying these doesn't even say it. does not say anything about criticize, that's it's correct. It's, 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 it's which is why the right. which is why it's context free. Yeah, the yeah. would never, would have that's right. The previous statements were all in context. He's yeah. saying the right these rabbis are useless. Yeah. Or these rabbis don't teach. That's right. Those are context to it. Here it's just the phrase itself, not in the, without context. It doesn't matter context, even and, if it's even if it's positive. Sorry? That's right, he's a fellow scholar, so he's that's correct. He certainly appreciates what the scholars do because he's in that business, he's in the same thing. And yeah, just using that phrase, he himself considered no good and fast because of it. He forgot. He forgot. It says Ishtali. He forgot. It slipped his mind. Yeah. It's such an easy thing to say. Oh, the rabbis down the street said that. That phrase. But he didn't mean it with the intent. That That's correct. And yet he still sat and fasted. Okay. That's, it's correct. Even though obviously he didn't mean it in a negative way. The context. That's right. Which is why the Gemara doesn't give the context specifically. So it's not about the context. It's just the phraseology. The phrase. Just the appearance of the yeah. as a disrespect. It's correct. It's pretty. It's pretty impressive. In a larger context, you can yeah. also use this as a, a you know, as far as <coughs> dressing people in general. Like you don't dress your parent as, you know, yeah. Moshe or something. Or, yeah. Or, you know, it's about to come. Oh. Using the name is about to come. That's correct. That's correct. Which is like this. Um, yeah. Well, there's one statement before that, which is like this. Levi Bar Shmuel. Levi, son of Shmuel, the Rav Huna Bar Chia and Rav Huna, son of Chia, have a kamatakni mit baches sifri de beira of Yehuda. They were uh, fashioning uh, uh, mantles for the scrolls in the study house of Rabbi Yehuda. Kimotim begilus Esther. When they arrived at preparing a mantle for the scroll of Esther, Megillus Esther, a Megillah, Amri, they said, Ha! Huh, We'll skip the parentheses because it's easier to read the Gemara that way. Ha, huh, this one, Loi Bay Mitpachis, doesn't need a mantle. As opposed to saying, this scroll. They just said, oh, this one doesn't need a mantle. So, Amalahu, they were told, 
Ki hai gav nanam mechzik apikursa. This too also has the appearance of apikursus. I mean, speaking about a scroll disrespectfully. Right? You know, I, when I grew up, and I'm sure many others, uh, you know, uh, we didn't put, we, did, we learned this once in, maybe in Menachas, about prop, treating Svarim properly. We didn't put uh, secular books or just random books on top of books of Svarim, books of Torah. Even within books of Torah, I always make sure the Chumash is on top. Sometimes they would come, they would come down to Shul and would see uh, uh, some other Sefer on top of a Chumash. They himself would stop and take the Chumash off or tell somebody else to do it. Likewise, a uh, Sefer falls on the floor, we pick it up and give it a kiss. Because Tillman is part of Scripture. Yeah. So anything that's of the Scripture nature goes on top of books that are not of Scripture nature. And within Chassidus, Tanya goes on top of uh, others. Because of the special status within Chassidus that Tanya has. Books that are backwards on the table. Backwards, upside down. down. Yeah, that's correct. Down, yeah. What about when they're in a, in a bag? They're being carried. Yeah. Like I put my tefillin in a bag with this. I have a sitter. That's and I have fine. Tefillin and I have a, that's fine. a book on Torah. That's fine. But that bag itself is put away neatly on the shelf, not uh, thrown at, not thrown around, not right. disrespected. Even the sitter should be put, like, it should be upside down in the bag. Like yeah, it shouldn't be upside down in the bag, that's correct. You fill in are like this, you don't put the sitter like back. You put, everything should be like Facing everything upward. standing in the bag. Yeah. 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 Everything is standing neatly yeah. in the that's bag. That's correct. Yeah. So even the way you speak about the Sefer, as we learn here in the Gemara, is itself, uh, uh, the Gemara doesn't say it is Apicorsis, but Merzik Apicorsis. It has the appearance of this Apicorsis level, yeah, this, yeah. the appearance of it. Yeah. In other words, a person is saying, oh, this, this one doesn't need a mantle. You're talking about the Megillah. It's one of the 24 books of our scripture. We speak about it respectfully. Don't call it it. Yeah. yeah. Put it in the Oran. No. It's the Sefer, it's the Chumash. Put the Torah in the Oran. That's right. Rav Nachman Omar, Rav Nachman says, what's a disrespect that would be considered a apikursis? This is something to point to you were saying. This is one who refers to a teacher by his name as opposed to a uh, rabbi or Sir or Mister, it's also something that's lost in today. The chivalry of, you know, speaking about your talking to your friends, you know, as a kid, just talking to your friend's parents as Mister So and So. You know, a certain, certain level of respect. So speaking, speak, uh, calling your rabbi by his name, or even saying his name, referring to him by his name, not just calling him by his name. As the Gemara says. Said, Why was Gechazi punished? Gechazi is a character in the Book of Kings who is there at the time when Elisha revives uh, the dead, the famous story. Um, and there the Gemara says, Why was Gechazi later punished? Says the Gemara, Why? Because he referred to his teacher by name, his teacher being Elisha. The verse reads, Gechazi says, my master, the king, he's speaking to the king and describing what he saw. This is the woman about whom the whole story happened. And this is her son, which Elisha revived. Referring, to, but not talking to his teacher, but referring to his teacher by his name, Elisha, as opposed to saying, which my teacher revived, or my master, or my, my master revived, or that the prophet revived referring to him by an accolade as opposed to the way he did which was oh this is the guy that Elisha revived so just for doing that that's why Gehazi was later punished even though he was the closest student of Elisha himself okay a similar story and we'll conclude with this a story on respecting um, scholars Yasef Rabbi Yirmiya Kamed Rav Zeda Rabbi Yirmiya was sitting in the presence of Rabbi Zeda the Yosef, and he was sitting, and he was saying the following. Also, that Kaddish Baruch Hu, it's going to be, there's going to be a time when God's going to Lahoitzi, to bring forth Nachal, a river, a base Kaddish HaKadashim, from the house of the Holy of Holies, the Allah, and on this river, Kol Minim Begadim, all kinds of uh, delicacies will be available on this river. Whether it's literal or metaphorical, I'll leave it to your imagination. But, this is what he says. Shinema, as the verse reads, in Yecheskel, Vela Nachal, Yala al Sfosai and on the river that comes forth from its from its uh, from its lips. From the banks. From the banks, from the edges. Mizeu Mizeh from this side, from that side. Call eights Michael. All trees with fruits. La Yubal Aleu, its leaves won't like uh, wither. Vala Yatam Piryov, 
the Chadasha Yitim Piryav, and the and the uh, the fruit won't won't uh, dry out. Is that what you tell me? Yeah, or won't cease. Or won't uh, yeah, won't stop to Yitim won't stop like with Tom. Always right. Don't don't stop producing. And the Chadasha of Yivaker Kimeimov Min Hamikdash. And it'll bring forth uh, new fruit every month. Chadasha of every month, Yivaker uh, will it'll be re- renew its fruit. Kimeimov Min Hamikdash because it's the waters arrive from the uh, from the temple. Yotzim is where they come out. While you appear the its fruit will be good for eating. Valeu and its leaves, Lord Trufa, as a will have medicinal value. So the verse is describing this beautiful, wonderful tr- uh, river that comes out of the temple, which has all kinds of uh, useful medicinal stuff. So whether it's literal, maybe, but on its spiritual sense, one can suggest that it's saying that the divine presence that emanates from the Holy of Holies is such that not just it provides uh, spiritually for everybody, but it provides physically for everybody. As one of the descriptions go of Mashiach, of the, of the Messianic era, that whereas now our neshama, our souls, depend on our body to eat, to stay alive in this physical world. When Mashiach comes at the reverse. Our body is going to depend on the soul getting its nourishment. So in the divine energy being emanated like a river from the Holy of Holies, there's all kinds of medicinal and food as if to say the body itself will be able to sustain itself from the divine energy that the soul consumes emerging from the Holy of Holies. Perhaps this that's what it means. In this yes. So how so? Amalei Ahu Saba. So how does it relate to the previous discussion? There was an elder present who heard this. Who heard this teaching, and he said, "Yeyasher, well done." You remember the expression "Yasher Koyach"? Mm. Yes. That's where that's the word "Yasher Koyach" comes from. It's two different words. Yeasher Koyach, which means Yasher means like well done. Koyach means strength. Literally, we translate it as Yasher means like straightforward or upright, upright strength, as in like you know, good on you. So he said, Yasha, well done. Um, because Rabbi Yechanan also said the same thing. He also made this teaching. So Amal Rabbi Yirmiya said, said to Rabbi Yirmiya, said to Rabbi Yirmiya, Rabbi Yirmiya taught this teaching in the presence of Rabbi Zayda. There was an elder there who said, well done. So Rabbi Yirmiya turns to Rabbi Zayda and says, Ki hai gabna apikursa? Is that also considered apikursa? Because he's not uh, being respectful. Like, you know, well done as if like I just hit a goal at a soccer game. Mm-hmm. This is not respectful. Omar Lay, Sir Abzeda said, no, no, hi, see you, Messiah. Here he's actually praising you. I mean, like, guy's not a uh, guy's not a praise, not a lot of clap after he hears a Dvar Torah. This is a version of clapping. Like, uh, he's praising. It's not the, uh, it's not considered a, uh, a disrespectful. disrespectful. Ella, Ishamalach. Ella rather says, Abzeda to Abiyamia, if you have once been taught that something like this is, this is considered a precursor and disrespectful, Hashamalach, this would be the proper way of this scenario that would be disrespectful. The way he did it was respectful and saying, well done. The following is another scenario in which it would be considered disrespectful. How's that? Rabbi Yechon was one sitting and he was expounding, was teaching. And he said like this, also the Baruch Hu, in the future time when Mashiach comes, God's going to Lahavi bring Avonim Tevis Magolis, beautiful stones and pearls or like gems, Shein Shloishim Al Shloishim Amis, which are 30 by 30 cubits, which is massive. The Chalkik Behem, and he's going to carve out a hole Eser Berum Esrim, 10 by 20, Umamidin Bishari Yushalayim, and he's going to put them at the gates of Jerusalem, and that's going to be your walkway. You're going to be walking through precious stone as opposed to walking through the stone that's there today, fashioned out of this one massive stone. Shinem, as the verse reads, um, this verse is in Isaiah, it's in, it's in one of the Haftarahs. Which Haftarah is it? I don't remember. But it's definitely in Haftarah because it, the verse is familiar. Uh, yeah. The Samti Kadiko Kadachar. Shim Shu Sayich Ushiarayich Laavne Akadeach Rugomer, which is, and I will make your pinnacles of rubies and your gates of carbuncles, making your gates and corners out of beautiful stones. Okay, so Ligl of Oisetalmud was a student there who laughed, laughed at Rabbi teaching, and Omar he said, We can't even find a ruby the size of an egg. Kulahai Meshkachinam, you're going to go find me a, a stone that's 30 by 30 where you, God can carve out 20 by 10 for an entranceway. Come on, it's a joke. This, says Rabzeda Terbirmio, that would be a case of someone make, uh, being disrespectful. But the person who told you 
well done, that's not considered disrespectful. The Gemara concludes the story of the student. The Yomim, some time later, Hifligus Finosa Bayom, this guy, this student who laughed at Rebbe teaching, was traveling on the ocean. He was on a sail, he was sailing on the ocean. Chazinu Lamal Cheshares, and he had a vision where he saw ministering angels to come and Nasi Avon Tevis Magolis that were uh, carving or fashioning these massive uh, stones, these massive precious stones. Amar Lahu. So this student turned to these angels and he says, Hani Laman, what are you um, making these stones for? Amri, so the angel said, God's going to eventually put these stones at the entrance way of Jerusalem. So Kihadir, when he came back, he saw Rabbi Yechanan sitting and giving a class and lecturing. And Omar Lehi said, Rabbi, my Rebbe, Dresh, keep on teaching. And it's good for you. To, you're, you're, you're good. You know what you're talking about. Keep on, keep on giving a class. <laughs> and he says, just like you said it, I, did, I saw it. You said it was going to be the big stones, and I saw those big stones. Omar Lehi, Rabbi Yechanan said to him, Reka, you, uh, you empty one. In Loira Isa, and if you didn't see it, Loya Manta, you wouldn't have believe believe me. Uh, Loya Manta. He was believing. Mala, say Rebbechen said in a direct, like negatively. Mata, you are someone who's scoffing at the scholars. Yarbeena, he gazed at him with his deep gaze, but also Galshat Samas, and he turned into a uh, heap of pile of bones, literally. Now here's my question. No teshuva? Uh. Come on. He came back and said, look, I'm sorry. So perhaps, this is why the Gemara tells us a small detail in the story. When, when, did, he, when did he tell Rabbi Yechanan, you're, doing, you're good? He saw it himself. Right? No? But, 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 what, what was Rabbi Yechanan doing at the time? Teaching the class. Oh. So it's disrespectful to the That's class. right. Disrespectful. Even in his coming back and apologizing, he's disrespectful. Yeah. He's in the middle of a class and he interrupts the class and says, Oh, you're good. Yeah. What? No, maybe Big mistake. No, that's it. Yosef Kadarish. He was sitting and teaching. And in the middle of the class, he tells him, Oh, you're good. Keep on going. Like, mm. what? But they said, No, he's in the problem. He says, Blood, you're insulting the Chamas. He said, That's the Muna. But the point where Brechan said, I understand. You, see it, you, would, you think you don't trust me. Only if you see it, you believe me. And you, you, and you demonstrate me. you don't trust me because you're interrupting the class. If you did, you would sit and listen with respect. Um, Perhaps that's also part of the story. Mm-hmm. It's a detail I think is part of the story. Now, the Gemara could just say, "Ask Rabbi Yechonon." He found Rabbi Yechonon. He has to say, "Dafka that he's Yosef Kadarish." The point is, that even no, he wants to, he wants even when he came back, he wasn't uh, properly respectful. He right. wasn't. In other words, he didn't truly trust Rabbi Yechonon. He was trusting his right. own vision, exactly. which is why when he came back, he was disrespectful enough to even to even interrupt the class. Okay, wonderful day, everybody.